God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night. His light will shine. God is good. <laughs> My God is good. All the time. He is not good sometimes. He is not good sometimes. He is good all the time. I know it might be dark. I know it might not be clear. But God is good. All the time, he put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. I still got joy and chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I will be going again. I'm not held by my own strength. Help me. I'll put my trust in my Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Regardless of anything this morning, God is good. No matter what you're going through, no matter the situation, God is good. Hallelujah. All right, this morning. Hallelujah. It's a good place to dance. Give him your dance offering. Hallelujah.
this morning.
of anything you are good you are a good God you are a good father you are a good father God is good he has done me well oh my soul this morning rise up God is good he has done us well, oh, our soul, this morning. Rise up and praise the Lord. God is good. He has done me well, oh, my soul. Hear me. Rise up and praise the Lord. Now won't you know? Can you raise your sound to him this morning? Can you raise your sound to him this morning? Let him hear you. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. Let him hear you. He can hear you. He can hear you. Lift up your voice. He's not deaf. He can hear you. Raise your voice. Hey, hey, hey. We raise our sound.
that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in the sight oh Lord can we pray this prayer quietly let the words let the words of my mouth oh God meditations oh God acceptable in the sight Acceptable God.
Somebody give God praise. Somebody give God praise. Somebody give God praise. Somebody give God praise. If you're glad to be in the house this morning, let me hear a big shout of hallelujah. Okay, I, I know it's I know it's 9:50 in the morning. Some of us aren't morning people. Some of us are. Look at your neighbor, say welcome, welcome, welcome. Look for somebody else, go, go shake somebody's hand, get out of your seat, go shake somebody's hand, say welcome, welcome, welcome this morning. Look for somebody, if they're not smiling, find somebody that's smiling, tell them welcome, welcome, welcome. Amen, amen, amen. If you haven't left your seat, you haven't listened yet, look, leave your seat. It's not a, leave your seat, go find somebody. Uh, there you go, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell them welcome, 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 welcome. There it is, there it is, there it is. You're looking good, you're looking good. Good to see you. Good to be welcome, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good, there it is, there it is, there it is. Uh huh, uh huh. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. There it is, there it is. All right, okay, nice enough. Go back, go back, go back. We don't, we've opened the floodgates. It's like, ooh. <laughs> Celebrate Jesus in the house. Amen. Amen. Welcome to day five of Word Explosion. How many people have recovered if you were here? Yes, how many people have recovered from yesterday? Somebody shout overflow. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Look at somebody else and shout overflow. That will be the testimony of your life in this season in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Also want to appreciate and celebrate um, with us this morning. Mama and Papa Todd, Brenda and Tommy Todd, they're here in the building. We celebrate, we celebrate them. Also want to appreciate Dr. and uh, Mrs. Miles, they are here in the building. We celebrate you, sir, we celebrate. I want to celebrate everyone in the building this morning. Amen, 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 amen. How many people are ready? How many people are ready for God's word this morning? Look at your neighbor and say, fasten your seatbelt. Father, we thank you that the entrance of your word bring it light. We thank you, O oh God, that you are not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent. If you have said it, will you not do it? If you have spoken it, will it not come to pass? So, Father, O oh God, we give you glory. We give you honor. Adoration and thanksgiving be unto you, O oh God. We thank you for what you have started, what you have done, and what you are yet to do. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Also, before I do that, unless I forget, also, um, for me, it's interesting, it's a beautiful time, because a lot of people from Greenwood, um, where we started ministry, um, are here. And I see uh, Twyla in the building, she's here as well. Please appreciate her. And ma'am, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Abena is also here. Please celebrate from Transformation Church. They're here. Thank you so much for being with us. So it feels like a family reunion for me. Seeing everybody, it's like, oh, good to see you. It's been over 14 years, but you look the same. <laughs> no, but they look so good. Amen. All right, are we ready for the word? Our speaker today needs no introduction. Look to neighbor and tell them, if you know, you know. If you don't know, you are about to find out. <laughs> Look to neighbor and say, if you know, you know. 
If you don't know, you're about to find out. Amen. He is a son of the house, but we are a church that appreciates our own. This prophet is celebrated in his own house. We appreciate the gift of God. I say it unashamedly anywhere, one of the wisest minds of our generation. There's no way that I will go that you can flex with anybody. Who you get, put your own down. We put our own. Let's go. Any topic, we are covered. Is it theology? We are covered. Is it governance? We are covered. Is it strategy? We are covered. Is it psychology? We are covered. Any ology? Who you get? In other words, who do you have? So I'm super excited. Please welcome Hatsuka Olakule Shoria, fondly known as PK. Hallelujah. Amen. Give the Lord a shout offering. Celebrate. And you may be seated. God bless you all. God bless you all. It's with great pleasure again, like I say every time, there's no place like home. Uh, doing whatever I do outside is inspiring for me, comforting but there's nothing as assuring, validating as when you receive all of that right at your base. That is family, that is priceless. I honor that, I can never ever take that for granted. And I thank our pastors for their magnanimity and graciousness. Pastor Jay says it every time, we honor our own. And that's priceless for me. The easiest things to do is Jesus that said it. A prophet is without honor except in his own base. You know, so I don't take this for granted. This is not the natural energy. This is anti the energy doing this. So church, I wanted to help me put your hands together for our pastors, Pastor Jay and Pastor Tolu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma, for your graciousness, for your magnanimity. I don't take it for granted. Um, it's a privilege to be of service in this house. It drives me, um, it governs my thinking, my behavior on many levels wherever I am in the world, right? Again, I want to thank everyone who has made time out to come out, Shawarians who are here, and everyone who's put us out to be here today. God bless you. Um, Papa T and Mama B, thank you for showing up this morning despite all the you know, itinerary of the last five days. Dr. Miles and Camilla, I love you, you know that. <laughs> it's a blessing to have you, all our pastors. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm gonna read some scriptures real quick. Um, okay, so I have my book here. If you have time to get to the bookshop, A Love Affair with Failure, like it was announced, forwarded by Bishop T.D. Jakes, published by Forbes, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, best-selling book. Um, if you have time to check it out, it will help you and your understanding of winning and um, territorially, if you know what I mean. So if you have your scriptures, you want to just open very quickly, I'm just going to read quite a number of them and then we move on. The first one I'm going to read is in Genesis 127, you all know it. Sorry, Genesis 126 to 31. And God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth right uh, my next scripture is first john 4 17. first john 4 17. this is how love is made thank you sir this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. For as he is, so we are in the world. I'll read another one very quickly. This one says, Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse seven. Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse seven. Surely, 
Oppression destroys a man's reason. Not a man's reasoning. A man's reason. In other words, a man's why. Oppression attacks your why. And you know that once you lose your faculty for recognizing why, that is a flavor of lunacy. The reason why people walk naked on the street, confused, just going around, is because the faculty to self-evaluate on why is lost. That is what people call purpose, reason. And this is scripture, by the way. It says, oppression destroys a man's reason. A man's reason. Oppression destroys a man's reason. Let me read you some other scriptures. I'm almost done. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 11 to 12. I returned. Everybody say, I returned. So in returning, it means that he was there before. <laughs> right? But now he returned. And in returning, he saw something different. What he saw was under the sun, the race is not to the swift. So at some point, the race was to the swift. Come on now. The race was to the swift. There was a time when the world was a jungle and it was survival of the fittest. The strongest takes everything. The one with strength takes everything. Yes. Now, the one with strength who doesn't understand tech will take nothing. So, but at the time, the battle was to the swift. Race was to the swift. The battle was to the strong. Bread was to the wise. Riches was to men of understanding. But when he returned, the software, everybody says software. software. The operating system had changed. The operating system had changed. And the new operating system is that the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. Neither is bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding no favor to men of skill. Why? Because time and chance overtakes them. Now, when, when there is an update to a system, he doesn't stop you from using your own system. But if you don't take the update, your system becomes slower, vulnerable to attacks, and begin to malfunction. But you still have the system. And so many people still have the system, but they are working on a software that is overdue for updates. They are not taking the update, and they are struggling with their system. Come on now, are you here? And you can live a thousand years twice on a wrong system. It gets to a point, it, it gets attacked by viruses, and it can crash. When it crashes, it's not because of the unavailability of the update. It's because for whatever reason, we choose the old over the new. My goodness. Are you here? Yes. Were you here on Monday? Yes. Amen. Let me read my other scriptures. Ecclesiastes in chapter 4, verse 3. Ecclesiastes in chapter 4. Verse 3. In fact, I read from verse 1. Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun. Remember, oppression destroys a man's what? Reason. And look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the other side of their oppressors, there is power, but they have no comforter. Therefore, this is, this is the antidote to that description. Therefore, I praise the dead who were already dead. So death has praise. Death has praise. Death is not loss. 
Are you here? I praise the dead who were already living because there are three people here. The dead, the living, and another person that is the most interesting person in this conversation. Therefore, I praise the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still alive. Yet, better than both of them is he that was never born. Better than both of them is he. So there is an existence that does not have to kiss the earth. And the Bible is saying, though you never saw the person on earth, the person existed. Because that person who existed is better than the person who was born, living, and the one who was dead. So existence transcends birth. Existence transcends birth. Birth is secondary existence. Primary existence is pre-birth. So there is pre-birth, there is birth, and there is post-birth, otherwise called eternity. Come on, are you here? Yet better than both is he who never existed, who has not seen the evil that is done under the earth. Amen. Let me show you one more verse and I'll get into the, my message. Are you here? You know, I'm not going to return to read these scriptures again, so I'm just going to run through them. Now you open now. Oof. Mm-mm. My internet is now the new weapon against me. Internet. Oh no, I don't have this time. You are in crisis, isn't it? Okay. So the scripture actually says that that if you live a thousand years twice, it's in Ecclesiastes, I'm trying to. If you live a, a thousand years twice, somebody help me Google, a thousand years twice, Ecclesiastes. A thousand years twice, Ecclesiastes. Once you open it, you show me. But the message in the scripture is that Six what? Six, six. Okay. Can, can, can you project that? Can somebody project that for me so that I can read? Ecclesiastes 6, 6. I want to show you something very powerful here. Ecclesiastes 6, 6. Amen. Okay, I have my app done. My app is open. Now, verse, from verse 3, it says, If a man begets a hundred children, listen to this. If a man begets a hundred children <clears throat> and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness. One translation says his soul does not see meaning. Or indeed he has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better than he. So a stillborn child never saw life. But the Bible says, though he's still born, what is the oldest stillborn child? The oldest stillborn child any time in history. Oldest. Doc, Doc, you can tell us. The oldest stillborn child is nine months. No stillborn child can live beyond nine months. Am I correct? Otherwise, he's alive. Am I correct? So, a stillborn child is a child who was dead in the womb and dead on arrival. So the, the oldest is nine months. Now, the Bible says that a child, a stillborn child can be one month, can be two months, can be three months, five months, but can, and I, I, I experienced one. I experienced the loss of one. So I know that the emotion is the same. Whether, you, whether somebody lose a 10 year old, God forbid, or a 50 year old, or a five month old, particularly if you've believed God for eight years, and then you go pregnant, and then in the fifth month, you have to lose the baby again. Right? I experienced that. The emotion was the same. But then what we learn here is that a stillborn child can have a better life than someone who lives a hundred, look at it, who begets a hundred children and live many years so that the days are many, but his soul is not satisfied with meaning. I say that a stillborn child is better. So because the child died does not mean purposelessness. Right? And then 
<laughs> he said, for it comes in vanity and departs in darkness, and his name is covered with darkness. Though it has not seen the sun or known anything, this has more rest than that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen goodness. Come on. A thousand years twice. I'm going to speak to you today about the weight of time. That is the new way Jesus wants us to see time. Part of what Jesus came to do was to give us a new way of looking at time. Time is oppressive. Depending on where you are and how you interpret the world. Okay, so Jesus, this is your time. You do what only you can do. You don't challenge us. You just change us. And you make us better. And give us shifts, precision in the spirit. Clarity more than ever before. When we know better, we do better. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the spirit of God at work in this moment. Thank you for the grace of God upon the fountain of life, church. Upon God's servant, Pastor Jimmy Odukoye. And let his grace produce life in this moment. Shifts in this moment. Clear movement from point A to point B. Whatever those points are, for everyone in this room, for those watching online, and for those who will ever listen to this message at any point in time as they walk their own journey. So we have declared and so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you read in Genesis 1 the conclusion that man was born with dominion. Now let's be clear. The dominion in Genesis 1.26 is not for Christians alone. Because as at Genesis 1.26, there was no Christian on the face of the earth. There was nobody born again. Neither was there need for any type of temperature of blessing for anyone different from the humankind. Because the blessing of dominion in Genesis 1.26 was on anybody born of a woman. The blessing was on the human being, not on the Christian condition. As at Genesis 1, there was no Christian condition. There was only a human condition. And that human condition was built in a format and presented to the world in a format. Therefore, the human condition in that state was enough to carry the dominion that we have in Christ Jesus. Somebody said, but when man sinned, he lost the dominion. Well, there's no scripture that says that man lost the dominion. The authority that Adam compromised is different from the dominion on the human condition. Dominion on the human condition. Pastor, can you come real quick? I want to use it for something. The, the, the dominion on the human condition is not different from his ear, his eyes, his hands, his lungs. When you look at a human being, there are three dimensions to what you see. The first dimension is the physical that you see. The physical you see is the container that carries his content. His content is different from his container. Now there are two dimensions to his content, which is his second dimension. There are now physical parts to him. Everything we see are physical parts. This is not who you are. This is what represents who you are. This is what some people marry, but this is not who they should marry because who they should marry is inside of you. They are here to meet that person and this person can never instruct performance or association or integrity. This person is limited. And as pastor, we say so many times, if what you see is all you see, you are blind, right? Because there's so much more to this than we can see. So this is not your guy. You don't love this guy, you have to love something else. So, but before you meet that person, you meet something else. The physical parts of this guy that are not visible to you. In other words, his physical parts that are covered. These are his physical parts that are not covered. His physical parts that are covered are his lungs, his intestine, his, his, his heart, his, his, his kidney. And all of those parts, they are physical, we can touch them. If we can cut you open intelligently, we'll bring everything out. If it's a killer, that's it. But if it can cut you intelligently, we'll bring it out, right? Because they are physical, but they are covered. 
Now there are third dimension of you, which is your invisible, intangible parts. For example, your reasoning, mm. your strength of thinking, your strength of character. We don't see those things, but they govern your second and your first dimension. Are we on the same page? Yeah. Now, you don't see them, but they are there. Part of those is his dominion. So his dominion is another organ that defines this person, but will never go away. They are dead. You can corrupt it. You can keep it latent. You may never use it. So when man sinned, the Bible did not say, curse is your dominion. In fact, are you aware that God never cursed Adam? He never touched Adam. What did he curse? The ground. Cursed is the ground because of you. In other words, everything Adam had before the fall, he still had after the fall. What he did not have anymore is his. Because before the fall, anything Adam needed, he got it one time. It was always available. So before the fall, he had this with him. After the fall, this has gone somewhere in the audience and you don't know where it is. The meaning of in toiling you will eat, all of that, is that to be able to assess this now, because the Adam is now cursed, he will now begin to toil. That is why I tell young people, you don't have a hustle. You are not a hustler. You have to stop hustling. Hustling is a consequence of the fall. It's not your destiny to hustle, ease is your destiny. And now that you are restored in Christ Jesus, you are back to ease. So part of what is happening to Adam, however, is that what he used to have access to easily, he will now have to guess and hustle his way through. So here is he, he wants that book. One month, he thought he was here. Third month, he thought he was here. Two years, he thought he was here. Sometime in the fifth month or in the fifth year, he found it here. Now, he didn't need all of this before the fall. Before the fall, he had control over this dominion over everything. After the fall, his animals that were pets are now adversaries. And everything changed. Am I talking to you? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Thank you, Pastor. So listen up, guys. Listen up, guys. So now he's got dominion is still on him. And if you want to prove, you want to prove that that is true, go to the circus and go and see snakes obeying human beings. Lions, jump, right? You see cobras moving to songs, to keyboard. You see a bear, animals, dangerous animals responding to human control. That's dominion right there. And those, that control is not led by spirit-filled Christians. Those guys are not born again. The intelligence is to imagine that if Adam had dominion over the fish of the sea, how was he naming them then? That said, the condition of Adam before the fall is not this condition of man that we know. This condition of man that we know is science and time that gave us this condition. The condition of Adam before the fall was superior to this condition. How did he name all the fish in the sea? How did he name them? How did he name all the jungles? So this guy had capacity beyond matter. He, had, he could travel and he could move in dimensions beyond matter. Because he had that dominion on him. More than that, guys, he had two other things that are very critical. He was made in God's image and in God's likeness. So there are many things in God that was evident in Adam, but by the time we were reading the documentation of Adam, we have missed his condition. But with insight and understanding, so there's a lot in Adam we may miss, but there's so much in God's likeness that is still documented. So if we visit God's likeness, we can begin to understand the original design of the human condition. Am I talking to you? If you limit your feedback about your design to what you know in 2024 about the human condition, you will miss a lot. Because this person that you know is not the person that God made. Corruption and a lot of things are coming. If Adam did not sin and Adam had chosen to eat the tree of life, you'll be surprised that your breakfast, you are going to have it on the Atlantic Ocean. 
and you'll be sipping good, you know, salad and some nice juice and under the ocean. And when you are done, you come out with three sharks. The shark will just ride you out, boom. And you say, I'll see you later. And then you go. And then as you are coming out, a liar is saying, I've missed you. <laughs> and you and the lion are saying, oh, let's go. Think about it. Was the snake crawling? Because crawling was the curse that God gave the snake. So have you imagined that the snake may have been, the serpent must have been working and standing because God then cursed him that he would be crawling. So definitely he wasn't crawling before. Otherwise the curse was not doing effect. Are we on the same page? Come on, am I talking to you? So when you think about the serpent, it's telling you that there is a condition in the garden that is not documented in our scientific modern world. And if you limit everything you are going to know about God to your modernity, you will lose so much to the limits of language. How much can English language do? English language was trying to describe a scripture that was written in Hebrew. The Yoruba language said, Ashiwiri, so long. Sorry, ma'am. What I meant, what I meant was that the person who says there's no God is not a foolish person. Now, English language said, um, the foolish says there's no God. In the Yoruba Bible, which is where we come from in the western part of Nigeria, says the lunatic says there's no God. Right? Now, they are translating the same word, but they have different meaning because the resonance, if the Yoruba language is different from the resonance in the English language. There's so much in the English language that are lost in meaning if it's trying to translate a Yoruba experience. Come on now. Because there are dimensions. GBA in Yoruba, think about it. Ba, 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 ba. I mean, we could go on and on. It's just the same GBA. So rich, so rich. How does English function in that realm? Of course, it's going to be limited. Are we on the same page? So it's not just English. You must understand that as we journey through time, modernity is going to have to struggle with ancient truth, particularly when ancient truth is timeless. That is why intelligence cannot interpret the power of God because intelligence is oppressed by no knowledge and no knowledge is adversarial to ancient times. We describe everything in the past as primitive and so there is an arrogance or, a arrogance or a type of hubris that is invented in our commitment to modernity. Am I talking to you? Having said that, journey back to the garden to then look at who God is. When scripture says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, I want to ask you a question. When Jesus was on earth, was that scripture still true of him? <laughs> it has to be true of him because they are speaking to a constancy of a design that transcends the limit of time, the limit of space and matter. So let's go there, guys. Think about it. This is not who you are. You can't interpret who you are if you don't bring into focus time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter are so important in the classification of divinity. Now, your known world through your hands and your senses attempts to put you in the prison of your known knowledge, in the prison of your own experiences. So when you look at Christ, at the same time, Jesus was son of man, he was God. Are we together? Let me ask you, do you think the Trinity came into force only when Jesus was dead and ascended? <laughs> we know that before the foundation of the world, Christ was slain. Now those are dimensions that you have to try to probe and understand, right? So when you look at how God is, operating in his awesomeness of which he has been more than gracious to create man in that likeness. He was so, so, so 
<laughs> beyond awesome to the angels. They have to say, what is man? Because we don't get it. <laughs> How come this man has all of this? You know, you know the way we see our body? We see our body as a limitation. If your body is a limitation, why, is, why do God need to indwell it? And why do the devil need to possess it? And for Jesus to come, the Bible says, a body you have prepared for me, O God. What you don't understand is that on this side of heaven, everything spirit is weak and limited without human cooperation. That is why God is always looking for a man that will stand in the gap. Because without a man, divine agenda is arrested on many levels. And so the contact with man in itself is the only conduit for bringing heaven on earth. Heaven on earth is not going to be happening without the human condition. So part of that is that man is key. When God was ready, he had sent men, walked with men. When he was ready to say, you know what? I'm going to fix this thing one time and once and for all. He didn't just drop from heaven and began to move. He had to find a body. There has to be a spiritual technology to receive that, a virgin birth. And they have to curate all of that. And they have to find somebody faithful to carry that. A husband has to be there who's not going to question that reality, who can commit to the idea of angelic visitation, angelic support, and can key into that realm. All of those things have to be put in place. And it has been planned before the foundation of the world because the arrival of Christ is not afterthought. You see what I'm saying? A universe has been prepared just in case Adam, Adam gets it wrong. This is the next plan. If he gets it right, this is how we roll. So there's nothing you can do that shocks God. Your mistakes does not shock God. He anticipates them. That is why all things work together for your good. It's a scripture that is an arrangement for your imperfection. Because if you can work everything out by yourself, that scripture will be unnecessary. That scripture is not for those who can fix everything. It makes all things work together for your good. It's an arrangement for your imperfection. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, yes, yes. So he prepared for that of Adam. If I have time, I will break down to you how the voice of God works in the human condition and in the spiritual condition. And how human beings who don't serve God, who don't speak in tongues, who don't do vigils, are able to break into some plans in God because God allows the human spirit to rove and to move at that level without inhibition. Do you hear what I'm saying? So let's go back there. So you then look at Christ and then you look at God. And you look at God in all his awesomeness, and he has placed that in man. Now, if you go to Jeremiah 1, 29, which I forgot to read. He said, listen, Jeremiah 1, 1, sorry. Jeremiah 1, 1, all to verse 3, 4. He said, I've ordained you a prophet to the nations. But this is what he said, guys. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were formed. So before you are formed, you had an identity. Because that identity was not sent to planet Earth, we will never know what could have happened if you had come. Now, the moment you come to planet Earth, we will never know how much of that identity you were. Because all that your mind can receive is your birth post, 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 no, no, not post birth. Post pre, pre yeah, post birth. There's pre birth. So, pre birth is what is saying that I knew you before you were formed in the womb. Pre birth. Now, when you go to post birth, which we call life, right? We will not know what was in pre birth. But you already said, guys, that's not a problem. You know in part. You prophesy in part. Until you come up to see me as I am, then you understand all things. But there's a dimension to you you will never know until you get there to see how it was. But what is true is that we now know that a stillborn child who existed for nine months, let me shift into that a bit. A couple were in crisis. Their life was upside down. They were ready for divorce. They were beating it. They were going crazy. Everything was upside down. They didn't have a child for years. In the midst of their madness, somehow, by some kind of moment, they had sexual intercourse and there was a pregnancy. 
from nowhere. And all of a sudden, peace returned to the home. The husband became caring. And all the problems disappeared. Darling, what do you want to eat? And everything had changed. But somewhere in the fifth month, or the seventh month, they lost the baby. No, don't feel bad. Because though they lost the baby, it was too late for the devil. They had connected at a level that was so deep, it was impossible for them to descend to that level of pettiness again. And so some one or two years after, they got pregnant again and they had their baby. Now to everybody, they lost a baby that was purposeless. Who told you? We just read that a stillborn child can be better than somebody who lives a thousand years twice. How do you know that the destiny of the baby is not to come and fix that marriage and go? The destiny of the baby may not be to live for 500 years. The destiny of the baby may not be to live for 200 years. Who told you that there's something called long life, short life? It's the weight of the Old Testament. The truth is credibility of existence is superior to the longevity of it. If long life is the testimony, Jesus was an embarrassment. Because he lived for 33 years. Who do you want to be? Methuselah, who lived for over 900 years. Or Jesus, who lived for only 33 years and thousands of years after, the world cannot find peace except through his name. Who do you want to be? Do you see how small we are when somebody passed and we are saying, what did he do? What sin did he commit? Has something happened? We are so small. We see between life, we miss pre pre-birth, we miss post-life. Death is nothing in our kingdom. The Bible says that Paul said, I have a desire. He said, I am torn between two opinions. I'm torn. <laughs> to die and be with my God. He says, I have a desire. a desire. You know, if you say that in 2024, they say it's negative confession. Wow. You, you can't have a desire to die. Come on, stop it. Yes. But Paul said, I am torn between two opinions, having a desire to die and be with my God. He said, but to live is much labor for you. It means I prefer to die than to live. To live is work. He said, if against my will, a stewardship is committed to me. Against my will. So, you are oppressed by death because we don't understand post-life. There is pre-birth. There is post-birth. There is pre-birth. There is life. And there is eternity. And in eternity, there's a lot there. And we comfort ourselves only by life and we define everything by life we look for our meaning only by life so when somebody dies at 50 something must be wrong when somebody dies at say something must be wrong when jesus died at 33 though i've already done better so what's wrong with christ the difference between jesus and me and all those who are observing both of us is ignorance of the script that defined him and that defined me the script that defined him is called app assignments protective power nothing on earth can take you out until that script is done and when that script is done nothing on earth can keep you here a minute after your welcome is disgrace once they want me to leave this stage I don't leave they will first be giving me a clock if I don't get it after a while maybe you go and visit somebody they say it's time to leave they won't even tell you you decide to get the time. Once you don't get it, you, say, you want to switch up the light here. You say, okay, okay, yeah, you came to the balcony. You are just sitting. Sir, we want to release the dogs. Once it's 8 o'clock, we release the dogs. Say, okay, okay, let's go to the gate. You get to the gate, and you say, bros, you need to go. You know, we play drum for you. We play the piper. You are not getting it. You need to go. Because once you overstay, your welcome anywhere is disgrace. You don't need to look forward to long life. You know, they say, oh, no, when God was, when the Abraham was dying, we built all kinds of theology there. The firstborn child, Manasseh, he crossed his hand to the left, to the right, and then he blessed this one. And really, please, who had time for that in the New Testament? In the blessing of the firstborn. You think the apostles didn't have firstborns? I hope you are aware that Peter got married. 
And Peter had a family. Who in the New Testament was given firstborn blessing, secondborn blessing? Because in the New Testament, the time is shortened. So that from now on, those who live should build as though they do not live. Yes. Those who buy as though they do not buy. Those who use the world as though they do not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. That's right. So I'm not saying nobody should be, should be firstborn, nobody should be secondborn, but the testimony of life and the urgency of the spirit transcends that. Exactly. Come on. Are you still with me? Yes. I'm going somewhere. So part of this is to understand that the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I didn't read that. It said, eternity is set in their heart. What does that tell you? There's nothing you can ever achieve on the face of the, world, on, of the earth that can complete you. The opposite of life is not death. Since death is a constant and there's no seniority in the grave. Like I said the last time, you don't arrive in the grave and say, please, who was here before? Are you aware that my coffin is gold? Can you move to the other side? Which kind of coffee made you? There's nothing like that. In the grave, there's no rank. There's no seniority. There's no who came first, who came last. I'm six foot tall, broad chested. There's nothing like that. The economy of the grave defines above anything the simplicity and the frailty of the human condition. Am I talking to you? Now everybody is going there. So it's not a consequence. Neither is it a reward. Come on now. Is the lot of all. For anything that passed the test of constancy is the lot of all. You don't get rewarded with death. Neither are you punished with it. Everybody's going there. So what is sure and guaranteed cannot be the comfort of existence or the consequence of existence. Since all of us are going to die, then death, where is thy sting? Nobody gets wiser above it. Am I talking to you? The opposite of life is purposelessness. That's what they said, that even if he lives a thousand years twice and he has no meaning, a stillborn child is better. A stillborn child in nine months can have a complete meaningful life and fix a marriage that 2,000 years cannot do. Those guys saw all the counselors. They couldn't help them. They saw therapies all over the world. They couldn't help them. A stillborn child came and fixed it once. At times when it's good, God is ready for your next level, it transcends the limits of logic. And you have to be ready for that. Assuming the meaning of death is that once you die, once you die, assuming from the beginning of time, once you die, you arrive in any country of your choice with your passport and your face on the passport and your name. Assuming that is the meaning of death from the beginning of time. I don't know about Americans, but if you come to Africa and the meaning of death is that once you die, you arrive in the country of your choice with your pastors and your name, with your passport and your name and your face on that passport, all of a sudden, people will be ready to die. First of all, embassies will disappear. High commissions will be useless if there's a house of death. The queue will be like from here to Japan. People will be queuing to die. Somebody will even go there and say, excuse me, are you the killer? You say yes. And so this is the idea. My brother was here yesterday. They said you use one knife. He didn't die for almost four hours. Don't you have something like bomb? Don't you have something like bomb? Don't you have something like a nuclear weapon? People will get creative in dying. You know why? You know why? Because it's not the events of death people are afraid of. What they are really afraid of is what happens after death. What the real issue is, they are not sure. They were ready to die when they knew what would happen after death. When they knew what would happen after death is the United States of America. When they knew, just imagine all those guys in Mexico, all those guys in Colombia who are trying to beat immigration and coming to the US. Just imagine that death meant arriving in any country of your choice. They won't need to go meet anybody. They don't be committing suicide. Boom, boom, boom. And be arriving in the country of their choice. (laughs) 
So people are not sure that heaven is there. The one that was sure, the Bible said he went to the third heaven. He saw it. Things he could not even write or speak about. He was sure. That's why he's the one that came back to say, I have a desire to die. He could have a desire to die because he's been there. He's seen their destination. So it's easy for him to say, I'm torn between two opinions. To go back to what I saw or to stay here for me. To stay here for me is work. I've seen a better place. You know how Isaiah said, my eyes have seen the mountain. I've been to the mountain top. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what was going on there. So all of a sudden, people will get creative about dying. Very creative. Now, this is the question. Just because they were not sure of the environment after death, definitely they are not sure of the custodian of the environment. So people are afraid to die, not because of the event, because when they knew the destination, which was America or London, they were ready to die. The event did not scare them anymore. The reason why they are scared is not the event. They are scared because they are not sure what is there. And if they are not sure of the environment, they doubt the custodian. So really, people are not sure God is there. So let's live our life and live it well so that if we die and it's not there, at least we've lived. Come on now, am I talking to you? That's what they call the fear of death. You are not afraid to die. You are not just sure of the environment. Do you know anybody in Haiti now who knows that if I can make it out of Haiti, Haiti, I will land in America, who will be struggling to go and condemn it? No, he's going to jump out of Haiti one time because he's sure of the destination. Now, the challenge is there's something called deep time. There's something called bended time. Bended, bended, B-E-N-D-E-D, bended time and deep time, deep, D-E-E-P, deep time, deep time, deep time is where God lives, bended time is how God works, when you are made in God's image and his likeness, you are designed to live in deep time and function in bended time. The reason why we struggle with the material world. Did you listen on Monday? That everything material represents a metaphysical truth. That everything material represents a spiritual truth. Your shoe has a spiritual truth that it embodies. Your wristwatch has a spiritual truth that it embodies. Your food represents a spiritual truth that it embodies. That's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. It's not saying you don't eat bread, but he's saying every time you read eat bread, understand that it represents a spiritual food. It represents another food you should be eating. That's why they said, you are hungry. What have you eaten? He said, my food is to do the will of my father to complete it because he wanted to have a physical food. There was something parallel to that idea of eating food that was deeper than biology. But when you limit your consumption to biology, you have no idea what you are missing in the economics of consumption. Do you know there are people in this world who will never say, sorry, can we do dinner? Can we discuss that over lunch? If your soul is not liberated at a level, you will never say it. You can live 80 years and never say it. Because to you, food means eating and being full in a moment. To some other people, food is a tool even for business transaction. But you can be so hungry and die in the immediate physical power of a food. You will never see it as a business tool. The reason why rich people can say, can we talk over dinner? It's because dinner for them, even when nobody is there, is more than just eating. Come on now, am I talking to you? So when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, he's calling you to a higher version of yourself. He's saying, even as you eat, let this food remind you that it's a version and a dimension to you you are yet to meet. And if you have already met this person, understand that this dimension to you, you have to manage. You have to protect. You can meet yourself at a higher level. On a daily basis, elevation is taking place in the spiritual condition. Just imagine that all your life you are going to be 10. And 10 years from now, you are still 10. 
And 20 years from now, you are still 10. What's going to happen? That is supposed to be a problem in medicine. Am I correct, sir? It's a problem. And at 24, you still have diapers on. That's a crisis right there. And people are like that. I don't cast, I don't cast as passion on them. But people are struggling with that. So growth is proof of life. Now, I'm coming to deep time and bed that time. Um, this thing moved from 26 minutes to zero. <laughs> is this for real? Oh my God. I, was, I thought I was timing myself. Okay now. Everybody look at this side. Me, I won't look at this side. I'm going to move like speed, Pastor. So move like speed, PJ. Move like speed. So guys, listen to this. Pastor Shola, good to see you. Listen to this, guys. Cha, cha, cha. Bend the time. Now listen, there's something in science, there's a theory in science called parallel universes. It's the idea that, and I'm explaining in layman term, you can be in more than one place at the same time doing two different things, doing multiple things. That is parallel universe. Before you say, oh, so how do you do that as a human being? No. The Bible says you are here in this room. The Bible also says you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So you are here physically, but you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So that is a parallel universe. There's a universe you are in that we see you in. There's another universe you are functioning in, but to declare your authority and to manage the judgment according to Psalm 149, the last verse, that we bring this judgment to the world and we join, judge the elements of the world, you will never be able to function in that authority if you don't understand that there is more to you because there is a you that is blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So at times when you look to heaven for what is already yours, it's a conflict of understanding. Everything you are praying about has been given to you. Everything. The performance of the spiritual condition is not earth to heaven. It's heaven to your spirit and you to the world. So this body that we carry, without this body, heaven is limited on earth. So when, when the spirit enters you with your permission, that's indwelling. When the spirit enters a human being without permission, that's possession. So, but both God and the devil need to live in man. Because if both of them, one of them don't live in that human being, that human being cannot be maximized or retrogressed or stagnated. So God must live inside you. It's not because he's kind to you. It's because it's a necessity of the connection between the spiritual condition and the material condition. The devil also gets that. He must find a human being to live in. That's why people, demons possess human beings. They possess human beings because without the human body, they can't do anything. If a demon can go through this wall to the other side on earth, it's a problem. It's not power. Because if you know that one demon can travel all over the world, his body is limited here. So he can't touch this thing. If he tries to touch it, his hand will go through it. If he wants to touch this thing, he needs to be the human being who can carry this thing. So people say, oh, the devil did this. The devil made me do this. I said, if I want to go to hell now, there's nothing God can do to stop me. Because I'm made in his image and in his likeness. I do what I will, there's no searching of my understanding. If I tell God, I'm going to hell. I'm going to go to hell. He can't stop me. He can negotiate. He can send angels. He can try to convince me. He can send me data. He can send me information. But if I choose to go to hell, nothing can stop me. Now, if God cannot stop you from going to hell, how do you tell me that the devil can stop you from doing anything? God has to come and negotiate with you, angelic support, the ministry of prayer of agreement, send anointing oil, all kinds of things to make you do his will. But the devil is just making you do his will anyhow. No, there's something wrong in that theology. I, I can't accept that. It is first of all that you don't know who we are. When you understand who we are, you see that God needs your cooperation to achieve his agenda of the earth. If God needs cooperation, the devil needs more than that. Don't let me go deeper than that. Let me just let you understand. Because there are dimensions to that. Because the dimension where you understand that is that no demon, no devil, no witch, no wizard can take you. 
there is nothing in jazz, there's nothing in voodoo. The reason why voodoo works is shared belief. When voodoo was voodoo and raw, we were colonized. What colonized us was ordinary gunpowder. It's not recognized in warfare today. Where was all the, somebody should have stayed in their room and called the name of Lord Lugard and just finished him. They couldn't call him, they couldn't call Abata, they didn't call anybody. It's not that serious. The reason why the white man got away with everything in that sense was because he did not share belief with the Africans who were trying to get him with their cheap psychology. Because to whom you yield yourself to obey, the same shall be your master. There's no mastery over you in that economy, but your yieldedness is the inventor of the mastery over you. And once there's shared belief, nothing is impossible. That is why even with God, he said, if you believe, nothing shall be impossible. And with the elements as well, if you believe anything can overpower you, they got it. Am I talking to you? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for you to come to a higher place. The dimension of territory around and available for us to take transcends the limits of how we see the world. So to close this in six minutes, bless you, bless you, thank you, Pastor. To close this in six minutes, what I will tell you. You are also in parallel universes because you are made in God's likeness. You are also supposed to be in t before time in time and after time. That is what they try to call your avatar. This is who I, you are seeing me here. But the, my avatars are busy in three, three, three different places. My son is where he is. There are things he cannot do. Even though I'm not physically there, I am there functioning not as a pastor or a speaker, but as a dad. You are in multiple universes. When people say, how can three be in one? I say, well, I'm already over 50 in one. There are people meeting now based on my thoughts somewhere. They are organizing based on my thoughts. I'm not there. But a representation of me, which is my avatar, is there. And you can deploy your avatar in different directions because you are not limited by this physical body. You are a spirit being first who lives in a body and has a soul. Your spirit being is unlimited. It can travel. It can stay anywhere. The internet the internet is a material representation of a spiritual truth. The idea that from one spot you can move and do things borderless in the world, that is possible in the internet, trust me, is more than possible by your spirit. It means you can go into tomorrow, you can stay in today, and you can stay in yesterday. That's deep time. Deep time is the ability to express dimensions of you beyond the limits of your prevailing physical condition. That's why revelation is powerful. Academics is good. Education has changed the world. But the next level of dominance in the world is through revelation. Academics is what you are taught. Education is what you teach yourself through self-improvement and observation. Revelation is what is given to you. And as we move into the future, a walking, talking with the, with, with the Holy Spirit is the highest level of manifestation because human education has been tamed by advances in everything. So the guys who are giving you internet, AI, virtual reality, believe me, they are functioning beyond logic. Yeah. There's no way logic can be your master and create or, or understand virtual reality or understand the metaverse. You can't key into those things. You can't operate into those things. How much more to make money? Look at blockchain. Look at cryptocurrency. Look at how the intangibility is getting ready to govern tangibility. The truth we have always known in scripture and now science is showing us that intangibility is not nothing. Zero is not empty. Zero is a lot. That is why the world was made out of nothing. Because zero has properties that can make beyond what the eyes can see. And anything you see physically on the screen is two figures, zero, one, zero, one. So zero is a property for creation. Wow. But when you are in zero, culture trains you to be afraid of zero. You dread zero. You don't want to be in zero, but if you sit in zero, that is the energy that created the world. The energy of invention is from nothing. When you need something to start, it's called one to infinity. It's horizontal thinking. 
is from you to the world. There's vertical thinking from heaven to you. That is zero to one. Have I helped you? So guys, this is how we take it home. At every point in time, you have to psychologically, I use that word intentionally. Everything you call affirmation, listen. Anything you want to believe. Do you know if we hear a sound now, I say this humbly. If we hear a sound from nowhere, boom, I'm not moved. I don't say, oh, at first. It's okay to do that, but I don't. I used to. I've trained myself out of it. How did I do that? God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. I am as bold as a lion. I fear nothing. I documented it. I wrote it down in my voice. Because when you read the Bible, you are not hearing yourself. You are still trying to sit in that moment. But faith comes by hearing. When the Bible was written, they didn't have auditory strength. Now technology has given us auditory strength. I can hear myself. And so through auto-suggestion, when I read without talking, there's a limit to how I can capture it compared to when I read and I'm hearing. So, if I say I'm fearless and I'm hearing it in my own voice, so I challenge you. Everything you want to be, write it down. Instruction. You want to be strong, you want to be bold, you want to be whatever you want to be, write it down. Take it into your studio or on your phone in your own voice. Recite it with drama, with energy. I am fearless. I fear nothing. Put it down and make it your ringtone and put it on your phone and begin to play it and begin to hear it. You won't need 90 days before you find a new state of consciousness living inside of you. By the time you do that for one year, two years, fear is gone. You can't continue to visit scripture on your terms when you like and expect the power of it to reside in you. It will visit you, it will have residence in you. Residency comes from consistent, repeated con effort. Yes. That is meditation. What do you want to believe? You can completely deceive your reality. You know your brain does not know the difference between truth and lie. That's right. Faith is the deliberate articulation to deceive the brain. You can make your brain believe anything, but you have to speak to the brain consistently with the words of your mouth. The words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart has to come into unison. And then your faith produces. Am I clear? So the consciousness to live in is you are more than this. The best of you is not in you alone. The best of you transcends you. The best of you is enough when you are alone. But the completion of you requires other properties. The top of which is God. That's deep time. Now into bended time. You know why a car harasses you? You know why you see a Range Rover and say, wow, what a car. And you see a Gucci shoe and say, wow, with this shoe one day. And you see a Louis Vuitton bag, you say, wow. What you know why? Because you are out of deep time and you are not functioning in bended time. Do you know why those things don't arise God? And there's nothing you can do that moves God? Because God lives not just in bended time, in, in deep time, he functions in bended time. You know what bended time is? It means that God is able to see the shoe you are praising when it was an animal skin on the animal. Then he saw it when it became a shoe. And then he has seen it 15 years from now when it will look like a coffin. Because it will expire. Because anything in the hand of a human being is, comes with expiry. And so the car you are praising now, God sees the car when it was not made. It was just properties in the jungle. God saw it when it was made and shining. And God knows in 15 years time, nobody will look at this car twice. You only see it now. And if you can see a car, you know why a girl will turn your head upside down? Because you are seeing the girl in a prevailing condition. If you can have the bended time to bend time into yesterday and saw her naked, a baby, helpless, vulnerable, and then you can come into the present and see who she is and go into the future when she's bended and her dentition is gone and she's walking like this. If you can see the three, there is a calmness, a humility, and an objectivity that will visit you in that moment. How many of you want to defeat the material? How many of you want to conquer cars, money, and all of that? You have to transcend into bended time. 
Whatever you come in contact with, don't greet it with acceptance. Don't greet it with view. Greet everything with curiosity. The curiosity you visit it with is the ability to bend that moment into yesterday, right now, and the future. Everything is nothing before God because God bends everything from today to tomorrow. So get that into your affirmation and begin to see everything. When they bring diamond to you, ask yourself, where is this in 20 years time? What is even the guarantee you'll be alive with it? So that you don't die and compromise principles where you are. I'm not saying you don't have a car, but please see beyond the prevailing state of that car. And know that in 15 years, nobody will look at this car twice. It will look like a coffin. So don't over celebrate it and let it kill you. So time is a prison. The reason why anything is called slavery is because of time, space, and matter. I'm going to close here, but understand this, guys, as I go. Time and space are one. Without time and space, there is no sense in the material. The interaction of time and space gives us the material. Now, you cannot be in time and not be in space. You cannot be in space and not be in time. So there's no, no such thing as time, and there's no such thing as space. There's only space time because you can't be in a when and not be in a where. And you cannot be in a where and not be in a when. So when you tell me that you have to die before you go to heaven, before you experience heaven, you are attempting to separate time and space, which is impossible. That is why Jesus said, yes, you are saved now. You are with me here now, but you are also seated with me right now. You don't need to die first because you are seated with me because in Christ Jesus and in life and his design, time and space are one. And so you can invent and create when you understand that nothing hinders you until here. I wouldn't have time to speak about choices, which is the instrument for slavery. I wouldn't have time to speak about reasoning, which I've explained to you. But I will have time to tell you this. Your dreams are not supposed to be before you. Dreams chase you. Never forget, your job is to use your free mind beyond time to not only see the dream that God brings. Somebody say a dream comes through much activity. That is a type of dream. That is when you are busy, aimless on the earth, you will have silly dreams. But every time Jesus, when Jesus visited Mary, when the angel visited Mary, it was a dream. So dreams come from activity. They also come from God and they come from the devil. The one that comes from God, we bring encouragement, we bring progress and bring life. Because the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And so watch out for that. But when your dream comes, you must have the courage to receive that dream and give it residency. The problem is your no knowledge. Because the dream that God brings is the one that says, I am able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above whatever you can think or imagine. So people say, oh, the dream is imagination. I say, no, what God does is beyond imagination. So right now, if you imagine that we are living in the sky and cars are flying, it is possible because once it can enter your mind, it has gone below what God can do because what God can do is exceedingly abundantly above whatever you can think or imagine. So start believing in everything. The first step towards your dream is not capital. The first step towards your dream is belief. And when you start believing, the elements begin to come and conspire. And everything begins to come into zone to introduce you to your nest. Never in your life look at your pocket to design the dreams you have to create. I have journeyed from zero to who I am all day long, not because I have any backup or any sponsor, but the idea that God is the creator that lifts the poor from the dunghill and set them among nobles, that the character of our king is to take nothing into everything. Scripture says, having nothing, yet owning everything. Rise to your feet, guys. I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray. Now understand this. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Our, our first prayer is the ability, we're going to pray for the ability to sit in dimensions beyond the physical eyes. You are a God. Do you know you are deity? You are deity. Scripture says that know ye not that ye are gods to whom the kingdom of God has been revealed. Do you know you can look, just a look 
can chase all the demons around you away. Just, just a look. But that look has to come from the knowledge of what is operating inside of you. They told me about a girl one time who she said she confessed she has killed so many people. I said, first of all, is she lying? Because she doesn't know the economics of death. So she's hungry and tired. And so she's hallucinating. So the state is seen is not true. I can bet. And they said, they want to bring her to me. You know, we need to pardon. I'm not fasting nothing. I'm not praying nothing. I don't have time for that. When I'm praying, I'm fasting. I'm talking to God. My behavior when I'm talking to God is different when I'm talking to the devil. When I'm talking to the devil, I give instructions. I don't talk to God. I don't talk to God like I'm talking to the devil. Father, do this. No, it's God I'm talking to. I can become. Dad, what's up? You know, when I understood fatherhood, it was my pastor that allowed me there. I didn't understand fatherhood. Because I grew up in a polygamous home. I can't remember me and my dad sitting down to discuss the future. It never happened. So now in Christ Jesus, I can do that. And listen, guys, you have to be able to understand that you have been given everything available in God. Not some powers. All power. All authority has been given to you. You are now God's agent declaring on the face of the earth. Now your combat, your resistance is from the limits of time. But you have to transcend that to know that you don't walk in Kronos, you walk in Kairos. And a day can be to you like a thousand years. And a thousand years can be like a day. So I don't think like that, oh, I have, to be, I have to make this money at this time, I have to be this, I don't even think about money at all. You will do what it will do once there is a believing soul and it's believing spirit. Wow. So raise up your hands to heaven. I declare, I declare by the spirit of God, I put a demand of the grace of God on this house. I put a demand of the grace of God upon God's servant, upon everything God has designed to be the value in this house. Excellence, humility, resources, everything that God has blessed us with as a house. Whether you are visiting us or you are part of this family, this grace begins to expand your territory from this moment in the name of Jesus. You begin to see favor unprecedented. You begin to see acceptance unprecedented. You begin to see dimensions of authority unprecedented. Now listen to this prophecy. The next seven years is everything. We've known life as we thought we knew it. Anything you did in the last three years of your life, 2020 to 2023, is excusable. You are free to get away with it. Whatever you did or did not do, believe me, there's enough grace that will not make it count. Your errors in the last three years will not stop you, I promise you. Write this down. But listen to God's word today. If you know me, you know one of the rarest things you will ever hear me say is, thus says the Lord. I don't say it unguardedly. I speak to you now clearly by God's voice. The next seven years is for perfection. The next seven years is the foundation of your next 30 years. Listen to the word of the Lord. If you add 30 years to anybody's age living, they are either full-blown adults or they are at the departure lounge of life ready to take the flight or they have taken it. If you are one today, you'll be 31 in 30 years. If you are 10, you'll be 40. If you are 20, you'll be 50. If you are 30, you'll be 60. If you are 40, you'll be 70. If you are 50 and 50 plus like me, you will be 80 something. If you are 60 already, you'll be 90. If you are 70, you'll be 100. How many 100 years old do you know? Listen to me, guys. The future is 30. For everybody living on the face of the earth. Now listen, the next seven years, you know how God spoke to, Pharaoh, to Joseph and said seven years of farming? and seven years of saving, listen, you are in your seven years of foundation. Whatever, listen to me, whatever you did or did not do, in the next seven years, we form the foundation of the next 30 years of your life. Whatever foolishness you have known in the last part of your life, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, everything is clear now. Clean shit. The next seven years though, is a precursor and a prerequisite. Don't joke with it. This is the time to sit in the world like never before. This is the time to be working, talking relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you don't pray in tongues, this is the time to Nebro, Sakia, Misakia, Nikada. This is the next seven years of everything. By December 31st, 9th, 2030, the size of your pocket, the weight of your peace, the character of your legacy will be proportional to what you did or did not do in the next seven years. Newness has come. 
new vistas, new frontiers, new territory, new visions. Now receive it in Jesus' name. Come on. Now begin to pray in the spirit. Receive it, receive it, receive it. Stop clapping. Just receive it right now. Soak it in. Soak it in. Receive it. Soak it in. Soak it in. Soak it in. Make sure you are soaking. Make sure you are soaking. Don't be an onlooker. Don't look around. Just keep soaking. Still doing it. Still doing it. Still doing it. Still doing it. Still doing it.